Tonight in Zephaniah, we'll be in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, where we are uh, introduced to language about uh, judgment, condemnation on specifically the city of Jerusalem. And I want to get a running start at this passage, so if you would just... Jump back up to Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 13. If you were here last week, you'll remember this was the condemnation in a, a series of condemnations, really, on various nations. This is the fourth and final nation of Assyria, and specifically her capital city of Nineveh is targeted in in the language here. So starting at chapter 2 of Zephaniah, verse 13, says, He, Yahweh, will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and he will make Nineveh a desolation, parched like the wilderness. Flocks will lie down in her midst. All beasts will range in herds. Both the pelican and the hedgehog will will lodge in the tops of her pillars. Birds will sing in the window. Desolation will be on the threshold. For he has laid bare the cedar work. This is the exultant city which dwells securely, who says in her heart, I am, and there is no one besides me. How she has become a desolation, a resting place for beasts. Everyone who passes by her will hiss and wave his hand in contempt. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the tyrannical city. She heeded no voice. She accepted no instruction. She did not trust in Yahweh. She did not draw near to her God. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are wolves at evening. They leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are reckless, treacherous men. Her priests have profaned the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. Yahweh is righteous within her. He will do no injustice. Every morning he brings his justice to light. He does not fail. But the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their corner towers are in ruins. I have made their streets desolate with no one passing by. Their cities are laid waste without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will revere me. Accept instruction. So her dwelling will not be cut off according to all that I have appointed concerning her. But they were eager to corrupt all their deeds. Let's pray. God, thank you for this text of scripture that just so clearly reveals your own justice, that there is no unrighteousness in you. You only always ever do what is right, what is good. You are faithful to only act in keeping with your character. And yet this, this passage demonstrates for us uh, the importance, the significance of believing and joining ourselves to you uh, so that we might even humble ourselves under your authority and dwell uh, peaceably, peacefully with you. God, I pray for all those here tonight that you would give ears to hear, that you would incline our hearts to wisdom, that if there are any here who even now are living uh, hypocritically and content to appear externally righteous, but not be truly changed in the heart, to not live uprightly before you, that you would use these words to change that. God, I pray that you would produce a humility in us that can only be produced, that can only be accomplished by your spirit. And God, we ask with your word open that you would accomplish the impossible, Uh, impossible for those who don't believe, 
to conform themselves to your likeness and even impossible for us who do believe on our own that we would bear good fruit apart from Christ. Those are only things that can be accomplished by you alone. And so we pray you would use the preaching of your word to do just that tonight. In Christ's name, amen. Tonight in this passage, we have four indications that God's judgment against Jerusalem is justified. Four indications that God's judgment against his holy city, Jerusalem, is perfectly justified. You may have noticed as we come out of chapter 2 into chapter 3, some similarities between chapter 2 and chapter 3. Most notably, the beginning of verse 1, this expression of condemnation. Woe. Woe. This is a pronouncement of a divine curse. Woe. This is not the first woe that we've seen, though. So this first indication that God's judgment against Jerusalem is justified is simply the curse pronounced. Number one, the curse pronounced. This woe is actually the second time that we've seen this. The first time we saw it was in chapter 2, verse 5, in a word to the Philistines. After naming some of the chief cities among the Philistine nation, chapter 2, verse 5 says, Woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Cherethites. The word of Yahweh is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. So that first woe is now connected to a second woe. And just as this first nation back in chapter 2, verse 4 through 7, this first nation of the Philistines was targeted for divine judgment. You'll see at the end of chapter 5, I will destroy you so that there will be no inhabitant. Here, we get another divine condemnation, and this links these two sections together. God's judgment came against Israel's enemies, rightfully so, and here we see that God's judgment is not only reserved for Israel's enemies, but also his own people, Israel or Judah. And so the same condemnation that the unbelieving pagan nations deserved Here we see that God's own chosen people are worthy of the exact same judgment. This is familiar for that reason. Also, if if you were listening just to this being read with no introduction, just straight through and knew nothing else about Zephaniah, if we, we were in the position of the original audience, hearing the message perhaps, uh, inscripturated for the first time and read, then it would have been really indistinguishable from verse 1 that God had shifted to talking about a different city. Because where the Assyrians and Nineveh have been in view for this lengthy section uh, at the end of chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, To hear another pronouncement of a woe to her who is rebellious and defiled the tyrannical city, the assumption just hearing the words for the first time would have been, man, those Assyrians are really in for it. And yet you keep listening and Assyria is not the city. Nineveh is not the city in view. It's actually Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem isn't mentioned by name. But no other city on planet Earth ever had claim by personal right and possession to Israel's God, except the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem, uh, the place where Zion, the mountain, lay, was unique really in all of history. She was the envy of the world. Uh, for a season, and one day will again be the envy of all the earth, because God has specially selected Jerusalem to dwell in. 
He dwelled there as the tabernacle, and then eventually the temple uh, would have been erected in Jerusalem. And you have that famous prayer of Solomon when he dedicates the temple, when it's completed, it's finally finished being built, and then God dwells in his glory, manifests his glory in Jerusalem uh, in a similar way as he did at the end of Exodus when the tabernacle was finished being erected. And so this was God's choice place. It was where uh, really Isaac was almost sacrificed in that great display of Abraham's faith in Genesis 22. This was where uh, David had offered a sacrifice when God brought judgment on him for numbering the people. And he, at that threshing floor, he purchases the threshing floor, offers a sacrifice and builds an altar there. This is where the angel of Yahweh ceased slaying the people. And so throughout the Jews' history, this place has been significant. But God anticipated selecting this place where his glory would dwell since the time of Moses. And then David, the king of Israel, the United Nation, even the one with the seed promises, chooses to dwell there. He has his throne there. And God makes that place, that same city, Zion, Jerusalem, the place where he would dwell. So no other place is like this. And here in verse 1, Zephaniah in his day is able to rightfully call this city rebellious and defiled and tyrannical or oppressive. This is what it was known for. It was not known for the righteousness that God himself was characterized by or the righteousness that God's people ought to have been characterized by. This was a city who was rebellious, entrenched in sin, wayward and against God's own ordinances. They were against God. This is why they're called rebellious. And not only are they rebellious, but they are defiled. There's a difference between these two descriptions. Rebellious would have been the active uh, deeds or the active disposition of Israel, whereas defiled just describes their, uh, it's a passive description of what they came to be characterized by due to their rebellion. So this is like God, through the prophet Zephaniah, identifying this city who has actively postured herself against God and against his law and thereby has become impure or defiled. This is the city again who is characteristically oppressive or tyrannical. And we'll see pretty soon why they are called oppressive or tyrannical. They are ruled by tyrants. This is Jerusalem. So this is this curse pronounced for, for starters. This curse pronounced is familiar and this is also warranted. In verse two, verses two through five, we see this second indication that God's judgment against Jerusalem is justified in that in the charges that are produced, the charges that are produced. The charges that are produced indicate that God's judgment against his city is perfectly justified. And there are six charges that he quickly lays out against Jerusalem. Charge number one is folly. Folly. This is their hatred of instruction. This is a city who is characterized by folly via her hatred of instruction. Verse 2, she heeded no voice, she accepted no instruction. That's the succinct description of folly. You'll notice as we discuss these six charges that God leverages against his people, against his city, 
these things are not restricted or unique to Jerusalem. They're not even uh, unique to nations, but even people can be characterized by these things. And so these charges that he lays out against his city, against the inhabitants in the nation of Judah, actually become very instructive for us. If Judah and Jerusalem warrant God's judgment for these sins, then so do all all others who practice them. So do all other nations who become characterized by these things. Foolishness. What's What's in view when he's describing the folly or the foolishness that Jerusalem has become characterized by? Just notice the the phrases that capture the folly. He did no voice, accepted no instruction. She wasn't teachable is what's in view. Just being unteachable. Have you ever thought that the mere act, the mere habit of being prone to rejecting instruction, that's worthy of God's condemnation. And if you wanted a simple way to think about teachability, parents, teach this to your children, imbibe this for yourselves. What is teachability? Teachability is humility receiving instruction. That's it. Humility receiving instruction. Someone who is teachable is humble enough to listen when wisdom comes. You do actually have to be humble to be teachable. And this is the primary problem with humanity. Just flip to Proverbs chapter 1, and we'll see that this is the natural state of all men. That they refuse to heed wisdom or instruction when it comes. And this is actually the same language that Zephaniah picks up on in verse 2 of our passage. Some of the same words found here are also found in the beginning of Proverbs and all throughout the book. And we'll look at some of these instances. The Proverbs of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1, son of David, king of Israel, he wrote these words for this pur- these purposes. Proverbs 1, verse 2, to know wisdom and instruction to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity. To also give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. Here is the first foundational principle if those purposes are going to be accomplished in your life. Verse 7 The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's the foundation of all wisdom. If you are going to be teachable, then you must first and foremost fear God. If you're going to receive real instruction, real wisdom, wisdom that begins, centers on, and terminates at the fear of God. If you're going to have that and benefit from that, then you must not be a fool. You must actually not despise wisdom and instruction. But this is man's basic problem. When God's wisdom comes in whatever form it comes, man rejects it. This even happens at time where uh, unbelievers are glad to heed to some wise saying. I came across this recently um, on social media. Uh, Someone cited... Abraham Lincoln as uh, saying some proverb, some wise saying, and someone else in the comments mentions that's actually from the Bible. It's great. It sounds great when it comes from some unbeliever because that's man's authority. So I like it. That sounds really clever. That's great. 
hey, you know, God said that. Oh, yeah, I'm not so sure about that anymore. That's not being teachable. That's a demonstration of foolishness. This language of Zephaniah, though, that she heeded no voice, accepted no instruction, he's describing the folly of the people. Accepting no instruction. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, somebody who doesn't listen very well, you might not think about them as hating wisdom. Hey, he just doesn't listen. Uh, Often interrupts while someone else is talking. They're not really listening for understanding, just listening well enough so I can say what I have to say. That actually is a subtle manifestation of a hatred of wisdom, a hatred of knowledge. This is what Jerusalem had come to be characterized by. And in verse 2, she heeded no voice. Uh, Even those words, the, the word that she heeded is another way of saying she heard no voice. It's the first word in verse 8 of Proverbs chapter 1. But in the uh, imperative or command form, hear, Shema, the, maybe you've heard of the Shema, right? That prominent place in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. It's called the Shema. That's the Hebrew word for hear or listen. And that really is your, your synonym for obey or listen. Let your ears take in this instruction with a heart that's eager to go do what you're hearing, to submit to the instruction. And we find this all, all throughout Scripture here in, in Proverbs. It's the first command in the entire book of wisdom. What do you need to do? Well, with the fear of the Lord in view, listen. Listen with the fear of the Lord on your heart. So if she heeded no voice, that voice, by the way, is uh, an emphatic way of saying, you know whose voice, the, the person who, whose voice it is is just left out because it's implied, it's obvious. This is God's voice, even through the prophets. She did not heed the voice, it could be said. She accepted no instruction. So she refused to hear God. She hated his wisdom. And this is the first charge laid at the feet of Jerusalem, the feet of the people. Incredibly foolish. The second charge is a twin sin. And it is that of unbelief. Charge number two is unbelief. This is uh, a distrust of Yahweh. A distrust of Yahweh, that is what unbelief is, is not trusting God, not choosing to believe him. And so in verse 2, she did not trust in Yahweh. Can you think of another passage, another proverb that calls for the trust of the Lord? Chapter 3, verse 5, that says, trust In Yahweh, same two words there, trust Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Just notice how much of the heart has to be given up and entrusted to God. How much of it? All of it. That is what it means to trust Yahweh. To withhold some part of the heart from him is to not trust him at all. If he is not completely trustworthy in your estimation, then he is completely untrustworthy in your estimation. Trust Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Again, the contrast there is to not trust him with all your heart is to lean on your own understanding. Verse 6, in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. That's another way of saying keeping God ever before you. To acknowledge him in your marriage, in your parenting, in your professional career, in every other task he's given you under heaven. 
in body life with your neighbors. Fear God in all of those aspects. And he will do this. He will make your path straight. He will give you clarity. He will give you direction if you have the fear of him in view. Verse 7 is like verse 5. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. Again, the, the parallelism is helpful. To not be wise in your own eyes is to fear Yahweh. To not fear Yahweh is to be wise in your own eyes. And the only thing left for you to do, if we do not fear God and are wise in our own eyes, is to inevitably not turn away from evil. We cannot turn away from evil so long as we are wise in our own eyes or leaning on our own understanding. To trust the Lord with all our heart, to fear him with every fiber of our being, is practically how we turn away from evil. There's a benefit to doing this. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Jerusalem is about to not experience that. (laughs) Healing to your flesh, refreshment to your bones, because they have refused to believe or trust Yahweh. This third charge that God lays before them, in addition to folly and unbelief, is irreverence. Charge number three is irreverence. At the end of verse two, she did not draw near to her God. That is irreverent. At the end of Exodus, the temple, the tabernacle, excuse me, is established, God's glory dwells there, shines forth from the tabernacle, indicating God is here. The next thing you see is they are instructed to draw near to the Lord with sacrifices in this system of worship. And then you have the book of Leviticus. Here, God's people did not draw near to her God, not in sincerity. You may have had some form of Uh, temple worship still happening, sacrifices being offered. But apart from a heart that genuinely fears God, apart from a teachable disposition, then what are sacrifices? Just think about people who are in form, drawing near to God, but they fit the description of what we've already read. Unteachable, foolish, unbelieving, not trusting God. But, oh, we've got the form. We're going through the motion, so we're okay. God is repulsed by those kinds of sacrifices. And he explicitly says so in in places in Scripture like Isaiah chapter 1. And he tells them enough with those sacrifices. So these are the charges that he's laying before his people. These are the charges being produced, folly, unbelief, irreverence as they reject God himself. Just remember the the things that we've already seen. Just to remind you in chapter one, verse six, the kind of people in this same nation receiving these same words. Chapter one, verse six, they have not turned or they have turned back from following Yahweh. And those who have not sought him nor inquired of him. These are people who are apostates and practical atheists. They're not seeking the Lord, which is why, again, they have to be told, chapter 2, verse 3, seek Yahweh, seek the Lord. They're not seeking him. They have to be told to humble themselves and seek him, to actually seek real righteousness and real humility so that they might escape this coming day of the Lord. And here, again, they're reminded they did not draw near to God. This is this city. Charge number four is oppression. Oppression, we've already seen that in verse one. They're called tyrannical. That word could could be, is, translated in some versions, oppressive, 
city. But here, a shift from the city and its inhabitants altogether, a shift is, is made to the leaders. So as are the people, so are her leaders. And the first leaders to be called out are the princes and the judges. The princes and the judges. These would have been like your executive and judicial branches, if you will, of government. They're determining the law. They're supposed to be upholding the law. Well, here's what Zephaniah says about these leaders. Her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are wolves at evening. They leave nothing for the morning. So in a word, he just describes the oppression taking place. He calls them lions and wolves. The princes and judges are. This is a description of their um, oppression. This is from the, the civil officials, the, the civil social life of the nation. This is what it's like. How would you like the people over you, determining your laws, supposed to be upholding those laws, might be described to ravenous beasts. They will take what they can. They will devour whomever is in their path for their own selfish ends. This is what's in view. So they're oppressive. This hasn't changed much from Jesus' time. And we'll, uh, you know, you fast forward 600 years or so into the, the future from this text, and we'll see that these things actually haven't changed very much. The princes, the judges are similar. Verse 4, there's a fifth charge, and that is of deception. Deception, and this is not from the civil officials, but now from religious leaders. So you've got five charges thus far, folly, unbelief, irreverence, oppression, and deception. And you see that deception described in verse 4. Her prophets are reckless, treacherous men. Her priests have profaned the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. So now the religious leadership is in view, identified by the prophets and priests. And isn't this interesting? You have a prophet talking about the prophets. We've seen this before. Uh, 1 Kings 22. You remember Micaiah, perhaps? There's one prophet standing against 400 prophets and the kings of Israel and Judah, telling them, thus says the Lord, one man against a multitude. And here you have a similar scene, one man against many, Zephaniah against prophets and priests. And he calls them reckless, treacherous men, just like the city. So are the prophets. Proverbs has uh, something else to say about these kinds of people. Just go to chapter 14 of Proverbs, verse 16. This proverb would have been an indictment against the prophets of Zephaniah's day. He called them reckless, treacherous men. Well, Solomon had a category for those kinds of men. Proverbs 14, verse 16. One who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil. Remember, we've already seen something about turning away from evil. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. One who is, turns away from evil fears the Lord. Well, one who is wise is cautious, and he does that. He turns away from evil. But a fool, one who we've already seen hates wisdom and instruction, 
A fool is reckless and careless, gives no thought to God's wisdom, and chooses to go his own way. I hope that doesn't describe you. Before you need to make a decision, do you consult God's word? What does God's word say about the decision before me? The relationships that I have. What does God say to me about how I ought to conduct myself in those relationships? We heard from Galatians 6.1, a brother is ensnared in a sin. What does God's word say to me? And Smed preached on that this morning. Do you consult God's word? Are his words to you, counselors? And so whatever God's word says, I have such high regard for the speaker that I willingly, humbly submit to the instruction. A wise man is cautious to do that. A fool, not the wise, does not do that. He is reckless. He is careless. This characterizes the prophets. Specifically in prophets, this would have manifested itself in a reckless, careless declaration of what God says, but from the prophet's own mind and heart. To say, thus says the Lord, when the Lord has not thus said. And so in the nation, this was common. You get a phenomenal example of this in Jeremiah, where prophets are freely speaking of their own accord, even with their law open, saying whatever they want to say, and then putting words in God's mouth. This was happening still. This was happening in Zephaniah's day. It continued to happen in the New Testament in Jesus' day. And he has to come and say, haven't you read? Don't you, didn't you read what God had already said? And, and why are you confused? The priests are similar. They've profaned the sanctuary. They've defiled or made unclean God's holy place. They have done violence to the law. So they have butchered God's words so that they can practice whatever they deem right. Just flip over to, uh, to Job chapter 37. We get these same words, uh, similar language in doing violence to the law, because there is someone that we'll see in a second who is not this way. This same Lord, the same God that Job and Elihu worship. Here's what Job's one wise friend that doesn't get enough attention oftentimes. Here's what he said. Here's the declaration he made about the Lord. Job 37 verse 23, the almighty, we cannot find him. He is great in power. Justice and abundant righteousness he will not violate. He will not do violence when it comes to these two categories, justice, righteousness. In contrast to this God, you have the very representatives, the priests of God. They've done violence to his law, and in doing so, they've profaned the sanctuary. So at every level of society, all the leaders, you'll notice that the king is not mentioned. The, the righteous king, uh, Josiah, is not mentioned. But certainly the, all the other leaders, I think this would have been shortly before the reforms that he made, they would have been in view. So princes, judges, prophets, priests, all of them do not gain God's approval. There's a final charge against God's people, and that is the sin of stubbornness. Stubbornness is what's in view in verse 5. This is a refusal to conform to godliness. When it comes to godliness, this city, these leaders, this nation— is full of nonconformists. They refuse to conform to godliness. Just look at verse 5. 
we get couched in this indictment, incredible language about God's purity and God's perfection. Verse 5 says, Yahweh is righteous within her, within Jerusalem. He will do no injustice. Every morning, he brings his justice to light. He does not fail. Wow. What a contrast to everything else being described. Yahweh is righteous. He doesn't do injustice. Even each morning, morning by morning, morning after morning, he brings his justice to light. He makes his justice known And he doesn't fail to do this. But in contrast, the unjust knows no shame. This is a a charge of stubbornness because God has been in the midst of his people and yet displaying his glorious character, his uprightness, his righteousness, his justice, and they have refused to conform to God. This is who God has always revealed himself to be. Even the fact that he is that and just notice where is he still within her, within her. That's, that's actually an indication of God's slowness to anger. You mean he's still all of that and willing to be in the midst of his people still? We heard in chapter one that the great day of Yahweh was near. It's near and coming very quickly. The fact that the day was near and not already having arrived is proof that God is patient. He is very patient. Think about the days that we, we live in. Right? We don't, we're reading this description about Jerusalem Phoenix, Tempe, Gilbert, Chandler, Mesa, Scottsdale, not all that different. The same sins, just look at them again. Foolishness, folly, unbelief, irreverence, oppression, deception, and stubbornness. All those same things could be leveled against the cities we live in, against the valley. And God hasn't unleashed his wrath on the valley yet just like he was prolonging and has been delaying the day of the Lord when his righteousness comes on the nations, especially Jerusalem. Still God is 2,600 years patient. I'm not that patient. You're not that patient. If we were as perfectly pure as God, we would have unleashed wrath already We're just not like him. To think of the kind of things you can find happening in our day, right, with the the kind of popular social movements that are all around us, children being welcomed to drag shows and children being taught in schools uh, that men can be women, women can be men, I mean, just incredible levels of perversion. And then you watch, you know, public video of of school board meetings and they have to make an argument. I saw recently an argument being made against time in a public school taken out where students were encouraged to participate in a drag show with faculty and other students watching this. There was an argument by parents being made that that shouldn't have happened because time was being taken away from instructional hours. Are you kidding? Forget the level of perversion. We have to tell you, hey, we were supposed to be learning during that time. I mean, just the, it's incredible, the level of perverted behavior in our society. But this is where we are. These same charges leveled against Jerusalem are appropriate for us. And just like we encountered that first woe in verse one, a righteous judgment warranted against Jerusalem, just like the other nations by God, 
America is no different. Not a righteous nation, equally deserving of God's wrath. And we will, just like every other nation, present when the day of the Lord comes, will experience the day of the Lord. We will not be rescued as a nation from the day of the Lord. This is why those who desire to be rescued must, as we've already indicated from uh, verse 3, seek the Lord of chapter 2. Seek the Lord, seek righteousness, seek humility. Those will be hidden when that day arrives. One final word on verse 6, this, uh, this stubbornness that Jerusalem refused to conform, uh, conform to God's righteousness, to God's holy character that was abundantly available to her. Uh, this is actually just perfectly fitting for the very reason that we were created. If you think about God on day six, determining to create man in his image, in his likeness, He's given authority and dominion over all of creation because bearing the image of God, he is supposed to, li- supposed to live in a way that shows all of creation. This is what God is like. His likeness. Here's what it's like. Here's what God's character, God's righteousness, God's patience, God's graciousness, God's mercy God's wisdom as he oversees all of the duties in creation. This is what God is like. Well, specifically, of all the nations under heaven, Judah, God's specifically selected people, are given that task. Hey, Adam, drop the ball. Recover the image. You're given his law. No one else has that. And the nations are supposed to look in according to Deuteronomy 4 and say, wow, what a wise God they serve. Where did that wisdom come from? Who else has a God so close as, the, as those people? No one. And what does Israel do? What does Judah do again? Like Adam, drop the ball. Proverbs 29.1 says about this kind of stubbornness to submit to God. (laughs) He who is often reproved, a nation who is given instruction, he who is often reproved, yet stiffens his neck, will suddenly be broken beyond healing. That That is a true statement. And one day, unlike any other time before in human history, All those who have stiffened their neck, been stubbornly rebellious against God, will suddenly be broken when the day of the Lord finally arrives. So these first two things, the curse produced, the charges, uh, the curse pronounced, the charges produced, indicate God's judgment against Jerusalem is justified. And then thirdly, the chastisement portrayed the chastisement portrayed in verse uh, seven, excuse me, verse six. I have cut off nations. Their corner towers are in ruins. I have made their streets desolate with no one passing by. Their cities are laid waste without a man, without an inhabitant. This is God's really just, calling to account, recalling what he has done to other nations. And Israel should have seen what God did to other nations and taken note and wised up and heeded the instruction. These things, just notice, uh, we've already encountered some of this language. When he says, I have cut off nations, that is a snippet just in micro a microcosm of what God will do worldwide. He has used this same language uh, according to verse three of chapter one, 
verses 3 and 4 use this same word, cut off. Chapter 1, verse 3, he says at the end of that verse, I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. And then in verse 4, so I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will again cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. So worldwide, this is the ultimate cutting off that's coming on the day of the Lord. But God has done this in small ways to entire nations in the past. You ever met a Moabite? You ever met, met a, an Ammonite? No. We read this uh, last, last week, but just about the, the desolate features of the, the land of those nations uh, to this day, really. And those lands aren't good for anything but salt pits. And you've had ancient explorers actually document that very thing. So God has done this. And yet, amazingly, against all odds, all logical explanation, God's chosen nation remains. Israel or Judah, the Jews, remain to this day. And yet still to this day have refused to heed God's instruction. Let me just point you, uh, if you just turn to Mark 12, the judgment that God's people were due in Zephaniah's day, those leaders who were condemned by Zephaniah are again condemned by the Lord Zephaniah prophesied of Jesus himself. Look at Mark 12, 38. In his teaching, that is Jesus teaching, he was saying, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like respectful greetings in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets who verse 40 devour widows houses and for appearance sake offer long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. The same hypocrisy Zephaniah was describing the same oppression that Zephaniah was describing is still characteristic of God's people when Jesus comes 600 years later. They're devouring widows' houses. They're offering long prayers as a pretense. These, Jesus says, will receive greater condemnation. The same condemnation that was warranted in Zephaniah's day is still equally deserving of the same group, the same chosen nation dwelling in the same city when the Lord arrives. And so he displays before them the chastisement that he has executed against other nations. He's left these cities uh, a wasteland without any inhabitant. And here is what the effect ought to have been. Verse 7. Surely you will revere me. Accept instruction. Again, teachability being required. The kind of humility that receives instruction is necessary to salvation. This was so that her dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed concerning her. But finally, they were eager to corrupt all their deeds. And this is the fourth indication that God's judgment against Jerusalem is justified is the conclusion presented. The conclusion presented. Despite all of God's warnings, in his providential dealings with the nations, 
despite all of his warnings as he displayed his justice in the light of day every day as the prophets came one after another declaring God's word, they refused to listen. They refused to heed instruction. They would not revere or fear the Lord. And so all of the destruction that was prophesied will one day come about because still the conclusion at the end of the day, they were eager to corrupt all their deeds still. Just think about what God is holding before Jerusalem, their commands, humble yourselves, seek the Lord, gather yourselves, accept wisdom, revere me, believe me. All of those things being implied by what God has required of his people. What's the consequence of doing those kinds of things? If you just thought, if I humble myself before the Lord, what's in it for me? If you really wanted to know what's in it for you to heed God's wisdom in that way, here's what's in it for you. Just listen to Proverbs 133. Whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease without dread of disaster. You want to dwell securely? You want to be at ease without dread of disaster? Have peace that surpasses understanding? You want that? Heed God's wisdom. What else is in it for you? Uh, blessing. Proverbs 3.13, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life, i.e. eternal life, is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. You want eternal life? You want riches and honor when they come? Listen to wisdom, find wisdom, get understanding. Her ways, wisdom's ways, understanding's ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are, are called blessed. That sound like a downer to anybody? But what does it take to lay hold of those things? It takes supernatural humility to actually heed to God's wisdom, to humble yourself under God's mighty hand is something that can only come by what God himself produces, can only come by great God's grace at work in a life, in a heart. This is what God has been offering to his people and he is making it abundantly clear that without him, they can do nothing. So just think, a people like Zephaniah's audience, um, all the humble of the land, hearing the prophet, believing the words, um, a people like us, hearing his words again, willing to humble themselves under God's wisdom coming from God's men, what should we do in our day? What's left for us? Well, you could certainly do already what we've seen. Gather yourselves, seek Yahweh, seek righteousness, seek humility. But what if we're doing that? Maybe, maybe you're hearing this and you're thinking, by God's grace, the spirit is at work in me and Amidst many imperfections, I do see a striving toward those things. Teachability, instruction, heeding God's word, seeking the Lord. Praise God. And what? Here's really sort of Zephaniah's final word, and we'll get to this next week. Verse 8, wait for me, declares Yahweh. 
therefore wait for me. If you are, by God's grace, the humble of the earth, then what is left for you to do is continue seeking the Lord and to patiently wait for God to act. And he will indeed act on your behalf. And we'll see the ways that he'll act on our behalf in uh, the final two sermons coming. So you can wait for the Lord as you patiently, humbly seek him. Let's pray. God, thank you for the hope that you hold out to us to encounter impossible commands and to have the full confidence of your character that you are a righteous God. There is no unrighteousness in you. As Moses wrote so long ago in Deuteronomy 32, our rock, his way is perfect. He will do no injustice. And we declare that you are that kind of God. Help us to be confident in your character so that when you speak to us, every command is welcome with open arms. Uh, Every command that you give because we trust you is met with an eager heart, a humble disposition. And God, I pray that you would make Grace Bible Church characterized by these things, not for our glory, not for our glory, but for your glory alone, that people would look into this church and marvel at the God that we serve and desire to worship this same God. Only you can produce these things in us, Lord, and we pray that you would, all for your own sake, until... Your day comes. Amen.